Good morning, everyone. Yes, um, <clears throat> as we have gathered here for worship, let's take some time and silently um, in your heart to ask God to prepare that we would have a, um, a honoring and glorious worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus this morning. Let us pray. O oh God, you pour out the spirit of grace and love. And so deliver us from hearts that are cold and thoughts that wander. Uh, may we have steady minds and a, a zeal for your truth and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So I'll stand, everyone. <clears throat> Grace and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He who gave for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. We're called to worship with Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Let's sing number 660. O oh God, beyond all praising, number 660. Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth and all creation, splendor and majesty are constantly before you. 
You rightly dwell in inapproachable light, and your sanctuary is everlasting strength and a beauty and glory we cannot comprehend. We who are your people can only ascribe to you the glory and strength which is already yours. And so we who are weak pray that you would enable us, Lord, to rightly, sincerely worship you, joining with all the host of heaven as we do in our hearts and with our lips, in spirit and in truth to the glory of your name. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please sit down. The third question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks a, 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 what seems to be a simple question. What do the scriptures principally teach? Um, the answer, of course, is what God would have us believe concerning him and what duties he would have us fulfill. You answer that question, then you must also be confronted with all of those duties that are left undone and those imperfect ways that we've believed upon him. These are called sin. And Colossians 3, 1 through 11, puts before us solid truths that we're to believe and solid duties that we have because of those things that are true. So listen to Colossians 3, 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of of the one who created him, a, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles on one point is guilty of it all. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God together. Almighty God, unto whom all things are open, our lives, our hearts, we set ourselves before you this morning. Where can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? If we ascend to heaven, you are there. If we make our bed with the dead, you're there. If we dwell in the deepest part of the sea, you are there as well. Darkness and light are alike to you. You see perfectly well in both. You looked at us, observed us, even before we were born. And in your book, all of our days were written. There really is nothing hidden from you. And we do take great comfort in this. We are your relentless focus, the apple of your eye. 
You have numbered the hairs of our heads. Mature, complete, and loving knowledge of us also disquiets our souls. We can fool others, and we often do. And we can even fool ourselves, and we do. But we can never, ever fool you. Your intimate knowledge, perfect knowledge of us, precludes any pretense, demands complete honesty. You've seen our outward sins, which we now confess, our deceptions and our lies and our gossip and our hurtful words, our loveless actions, our me-first self-focus, our irritability, our anger. O oh Lord, hear our confession of these sins as it fits our souls. We also confess our inner sins, the attitudes that are contrary to the fruits of the Spirit, our jealousies, our hatreds, our, our malice. Hear also here our confession of these sins, Lord, as it fits our souls. We praise you and thank you, merciful Father, as we ask your forgiveness, that the truth is that the blood of your Son cleanses us from all sin, and we praise you for the assurance in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. <clears throat> Let us draw near now with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Please stand. Turn to 877 in your hymnal. That's the shorter catechism. And we'll be reading questions 98, 99, and 100. And I'd like us to read both the question and the answer together, please, <clears throat> when you get there. We have a quorum who are open to the right page. All right. It's 877. With what is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will. In the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. What rule hath God given for our direction in prayer? The whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer, but the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. What doth the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The preface of the Lord's Prayer, which is, our Father, which art in heaven, teacheth us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a Father, able to, ready to help us, and that we should pray with and for others. Why do I mourn and toil within when it is mine to hope in God? Turn to 662. It's uh, Psalm 42, 1 through 5, uh, set to a great hillbilly tune. Um, yeah. Um, As the heart longs for flowing streams.
Let's be seated. <clears throat> Come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, says the Lord. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we now pray using the words of your Son, we ask that for the sake of your glory and for the grace that you bestow upon us, help us to be poor in spirit, to mourn over our sins and the sins of the world, to, to be self-controlled, to long for righteousness, and to be merciful and pure in heart, and to endure opposition when it's for your sake, your righteousness' sake. Father, we would ask that you would encourage us through your Holy Spirit to be active in every good work, making us salt of the earth and light of the world, that many might give glory not to us, but to you. And make us quick, O oh Lord, to forgive our enemies and those who have sinned against us. May we be quick to serve those in need, slow to harbor any murderous thought, word, or deed, to purify our minds of all wicked and adulterous thoughts, that we would rely on your grace to be faithful, both to you and our loved ones. And Lord, in these days when lies are the norm, make us abnormal, make us odd, enable us to speak the truth, not just in our minds and in our hearts, but truly when it's needed on our lips. Father, we reflect on our righteousness in and through Christ, and we see what a matchless gift it is. We ask that you would give us even more. As you have given all the righteousness that we may ever need, it is that corresponding unseen life of righteous prayer righteous fasting and service. Make us ever aware in all these things of trumpeting our faith in order to be seen and thought of well by others. Lord, may you and you alone be our master and thus keep our hearts from the concern, let alone the love of money or any other earthly treasure but instead, may we lay up treasure in heaven. Glorious God, we worry. We worry like a profession. Make us anxious only about one thing, the glory of your bride, your rule on earth, your name, your kingdom. Grant that we may seek it first May the cares of our life, the food and drink and clothing and shelter, Lord, may we, may we be loosed of worry over these things. Holy and loving God, you, you are the only judge. And so help us not to be judgmental, but to judge rightly. So allow us first to remember that the first one to speak always sounds right until another is heard. And may we speak of our sin if we must speak of anything negative. And if necessary, 
O Lord, give us wisdom to confront the sins of others. Help us to be prayerful, to knock upon the door of heaven and trust that you will give us the good things, even your Holy Spirit. Remind us always of the narrow gate for the sake of our very souls. Keep us aware of false teachers and lawlessness and keep us by your grace that we may never in thought or deed follow the wide path. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make us always attentive to Christ's words, these words which we have now prayed, so that we might build the house of our lives upon the rock of the truth which comes from you. We pray for the children of this church as they're instructed today and Though we are helpless to open their eyes and hearts, we pray that you would, O oh Lord. We pray for our community, either here or wherever we live, as we endeavor to share the gospel, realizing that no system ever won anyone to Christ. May we become personal in our reaching out to those who do not know you. We pray for our missionaries in China and Uganda and Ethiopia, Eritrea, Uruguay, Haiti, Ukraine, and Quebec, that you would encourage their efforts with new believers. And we lift up our brothers and sisters and their pastor, Paul Morreale, at Covenant Reformed Church in West Plains, Missouri. It is your field, your building, your church, your people, your cause, and your power to make the church grow and so strengthen those who plant and water, and may they bear fruit. For our government leaders, Lord, for President Biden, for Governor Evers, Congressman Stiles, Senators Johnson and Baldwin, our other state members of Congress and governors, and our state legislators, uh, those who serve our, our benches in the military, in law enforcement, Turn all, Lord, if they do not know you, turn their hearts to you. May, may their lost state be made aware to them. And may they seek you. And may they find you. And may in their work the justice would be preserved for everyone that we may have a greater opportunity to spread the gospel in this country. We pray that your servants would notice and minister to those suffering illness. And we pray for William, who's had a particularly bad week. We pray for those who are in persecution and in grief, anxiety, poverty, addiction. May we meet needs when we can and comfort them with the assurance of the gospel. Now, give us a renewed zeal for your kingdom now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's have the deacons come up. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 16 tells us to not forget to do good and share with others for, with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the precious gift of salvation you have graciously really bestowed upon us. We come now to you the gift that we give back to you, part of what you entrust to us. Very good.
Stand, please. How about a Baptist, a baptism hymn, huh? Number 411, Shine Thou Upon Us, Lord, as we prepare to hear God's word. Number 411.
seated, everyone. <clears throat> uh, before we read God's word, let us pray that God would give us understanding and bless the reading and hearing of his word this morning. Merciful and loving Father, all wise one, you do not will that your children should wander in darkness. And so we pray that you would pour the light of your spirit into our minds and our hearts, that we will know what the hope of our calling is, that we would know what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and know the surpassing greatness of your power toward those of us who believe. With all this, so that your grace may equip us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which we have been called. In all humility and grace to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, turn, in to, turn to the 62nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 12, which is the whole chapter. This is Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet, until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory, and you will be called a new name which the mouth of the Lord will designate, and you will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said, desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, Hepzibah, and your land married, Beulah, for the Lord delights in you and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night they will never be silent. You who remind the Lord, Take no rest for yourselves, and give him no rest, until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food to your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift a standard, a banner over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you will be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Every wedding I have ever observed or been involved in goes the same way. It follows the same pattern, basically. Everybody kind of somber music first. Everybody gets set up front and then the music changes and everybody, the doors at the back of the church open up and everybody stands up and they turns around and they're dressed to um, perfection is the bride. Her hair is perfect, her jewelry perfect, the dress overpriced and spectacular. <laughs> the groom uh, fidgets. Now I know what to do with a groom. I say to the groom, she's coming for you, you know. because he's nervous. 
But he is unique among all of the spectators because he alone is going to walk. He's taken her home from the dance, in other words, you know. He will promise to love her and be joined to her in something called a covenant known as marriage. And if the couple has met with a minister at all competent for counseling prior to this event, he has likely told them of something that marriage is a profound mystery patterned after the perfect union between Christ and his bride, the church. Only one of those things is perfect. Revelation 21 describes the perfection of that union, the union of Christ and his bride, the church. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Then one of the seven angels came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. In this passage in Revelation, the church has now been made perfect for the bridegroom, Christ, to take to himself forever. Every Christian wedding is a foretaste of this reality. However, I know, however, because we're talking about marriage here, right? However, there is a significant difference between the foretaste and the reality. In our culture, um, the bridegroom is pretty much uninvolved with the preparation of the bride for her wedding day. In fact, I, I think he may even get hosed down if he tries to do the makeup or something, you know. Tradition even dictates, for some weird reason, that he not even see her until she walks through those doors. But the radiant bride, the glory that the bride of Christ is, the, the church, the heavenly Zion, the new Jerusalem, is completely the work of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He found her. He sought her and he found her. She was sinful and defiled. She was made ugly and through rebellion and sickness, in reality, even dead. Each and every one altogether dead in their trespasses and sins. And he redeemed her and each and every one in her by his own blood on the cross and raised her from the dead and washed her with water through the word in order that he might present her to himself as a radiant bride holy and blameless. He did this for her because he was delighted to do it. He accomplished the only righteousness that would please God and won the only salvation that the bride would ever need. And since then, through the years, Christ has been patiently, passionately, preparing his bride for the wedding day. Every bit of her glory, every bit of the shining thing that the church will be on the day she is presented to her bridegroom, Jesus Christ, every single thing has been worked in her heart by the Holy Spirit, and there is nothing of the work of man in her at all. And when the work is finished, she will descend from heaven, coming down as God's perfect, perfected work. And, and when the new heaven and the new earth finally come, they will shine with God's glory. But the bride of Christ, nothing in that new creation shall shine with more glory than the bride of Christ. Except the uncreated triune God, of course. Her glory is not due to her own self or her worth, but to the own and only to the unceasing passion and zeal that the Lord Jesus Christ has 
for his bride's perfection. For spiritual Zion, New Jerusalem, covenant people of God, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, redeemed from every nation by the blood of his sinless sacrifice. He delights in his church. What's more, Christ's passion is not to keep his delight to himself. He involves the members of the bride in not the work of perfecting her, obviously, but they are posted as watchmen to pray without rest for the glory of the bride, to give him no rest, God no rest, until the bride, the church, is the praise of all the nations. The zeal or, or passion which Christ has also calls up zeal and passion from his people. Until his bride is perfected, you know, we are united with Christ by the Holy Spirit. We're partakers of the divine nature. In union with Christ, then, we have access. Our hearts soar with the delight that he has for his bride. And one way to conform to the mind of Christ is to delight in the church as well. So Isaiah 62 is a four-part description of this great passion which the Lord Jesus Christ has for the glory of his church. For Zion's sake, he says, I will not keep silent. And in verse 1, we, we find the seminal declaration of the Messiah's desire for the glory of Zion, the glory of the bride. For Zion's sake, for Zion's sake, put it on a t-shirt, right? I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. This is Christ's promise, uh, proclamation of ceaseless zeal for the sake of the glory of Zion. And in verse 1, he, he declares that. And I must say, at, at, at this point, some commentators disagree with me that this is Jesus talking, and they think it's Isaiah talking. And I wouldn't mention that, except E.J. Young says that, and he was like an OPC guy. So I want to make sure that you understand that I'm disagreeing with him, but I would say that the connection with chapter 61 is very well established. And there's no doubt that Christ was speaking there in the first person. And as the first person speaker, here it makes sense because of its connection with chapter 61, the year of Jubilee, the, 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 the people being, or that is the Messiah being clothed with salvation, the, the, the notion of the bride and groom being clothed in the clo closing verses of that chapter. And even if the speaker was Isaiah, by the way, um, his own zeal for Zion's glory only comes from the Spirit of God anyway, which was my first point. So Christ's goal, the Zion's righteousness and salvation shining forth is, is something that he has a zeal to accomplish. Christ will not keep silent until his bride is perfect. That's why he's still not silent. There are some elect who have not been brought in. There are other elect who have not been glorified spiritually. There, are, uh, there aren't any elect who have received their resurrection bodies. So there's a lot of work to be done until her glory is perfected. And it is work that he does by washing her, the spirit and the word. Look, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present her to himself, the church, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And, and yet, it is not just Christ who would be zealous for Zion's glory. Later on in the chapter, as I alluded to, there are watchmen who are going to be posted on Jerusalem's walls to intercede for the perfection of the bride. And there are going to be workers on a highway, on a smooth highway leading to Zion as well. 
No, the members of the bride are involved and, and they give themselves, they're commanded to give themselves no rest until God makes Zion a praise of the whole earth. So if you're a Christian and you're reading this, Isaiah 62 will draw you right into the passion for the church's consummation and the church's welfare and perfection that Christ has. For what he loves, his people love. Right? So the desire of the Messiah is for the glory of Zion. But this desire, this delight, doesn't stop with himself or even with the others who are part of the bride. No, this extends to the nations even. Verses 2 through 5. This whole passage is just riddled with expressions of delight that the Lord has in his church. A new name you'll have from the mouth of the Lord. A crown of beauty, he calls the church. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. My delight, Hephzibah, is with her. And your land is Beulah, married, wedded, redeemed. The Lord delights in you they're told. And so your God will rejoice over you. Zion's shining glory, the bride's shining glory, is seen by the nations. It's sort of fulfilled you know, way back in the 6th century BC when the Jews got out of Babylon. But, but the language here is so sweeping and grand, so glorious, that it cannot be in that fulfillment. In fact, it is not that fulfillment. The fulfillment here speaks on such a grand, ever-increasing scale that it is nothing but the glory of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is fulfilling these verses. And as the church grows worldwide in its holiness, nations will see her righteousness, kings will acknowledge and go into her. They will see transformation of massive amounts of people the glory of the king will attract the nations and the message of this salvation shall go forth to all of the globe. That sort of happens. Hmm? Zion will be populated more and more and she will no longer be desolate. But most significant of all of those things is, is that the people who are the bride will be called sons of the bride and wedded to the bride. Now, key to the whole process of being involved in the um, intercession for the bride is to have the same commitment that the Lord Jesus Christ does to her final glory. The same love that Christ has for his bride, so must the sons and daughters of the bride have. The language gets a little difficult in verse 5 as you're trying to work out how sons can marry, but that's not what's meant here. The sons of Zion merely share the zeal that Christ has for the, for the holiness of the church. They live out this shared delight and passion that Christ has for his bride by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in the world. We, the sons and daughters of the bride, in fellowship and obedience to Christ, must be wholly committed to the work of the church, to its worship, its discipleship, and its evangelism. That is the work of the church, threefold. We are to be living postcards of the for the sake of Zion type of life, building the church through worship and evangelism and discipleship and driven by Christ's goal and certainty of the church's final perfection. So the desire of the Messiah for the glory of Zion, the, the glory of that Zion is shown to the nations. And then he appoints watchmen to intercede for the glory of Zion. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. They imitate 
their Lord. The Lord posts these watchmen to accomplish the perfection of his bride. They don't perfect the bride, but God has been pleased to use the prayers of the saints to accomplish that very end. They're never to keep silent. Their lives are to be for the sake of Zion lives. Their mission is one of intercession. Um, they're commanded uh, to remind the Lord that Zion is yet incomplete. That, that if you pray for the church, this is one of the things that you have been commanded by God to remind him of. Not because he doesn't know it, but because you need to know it more deeply. That she is still needy. That she has a lot of work yet to be done. These watchmen are to give themselves no rest, in fact, in their intercession for the church until the church is made a praise in the whole earth. We got a long way to go, right? Well, this is God we're talking about. Um, he does not have to, he do, God does not use a project manager or a Gantt chart. When he wants to accomplish his will, he accomplishes it. The work of relentless intercession for the sake of Zion is to remind us of the overwhelming opposition that sin in the world is to the building of the church. And building the church is one of the, and praying for the building of the church is one of the greatest tasks that he has ever given to his people. The duty to be a watchman is not given to just a, a few people. Not, not assigned to a specific class or group or, or a country or a street, but it is every believer's task to stand and intercede with God for her. And he tests us in this, you know, um, because the glory of the church, um, let's be honest, sometimes is faded and dim. Um, the enemies of the church seem to have more powerful things um, they be, they're, they're better organized, that's for sure. Um, they are possessed of more resources. Uh, and we look at the work of the church and the massive amount of lost souls in our world, and it's immense to us. The thing is, we're prone to say, salvation is not going forth from the church like a burning torch, more like a small flame, the nation's. And our world see nothing, nothing of God in the human matrix that they live in. Isaiah is so heartbroken for his own people. His words translate very well into our generation, don't they? And then, and then there's the problem that every one of us is really committed we're really committed, but we're committed to our own pleasures, our, our own agendas, and not so much single-minded for the sake of Zion all the time. And so we grow weary in this work of prayer, when we, certainly when we don't see results, to pray for the glory of the church constantly, possibly not seeing any tangible results may cause us to be weary, but God is saying when salvation is not going forth, as a burning torch, your life passion should be defined with these three words, for Zion's sake. When they lay you in your grave, this should be on your epitaph of your tombstone, for Zion's sake. That should be the statement your life makes. God is saying that because, and this is really why, he has appointed his church as the human delivery system for salvation to a world overflowing with misery and death for Zion's sake. God says, that's my plan, and I ain't got a plan B because it stands on my promise. Go to verse 9. We have to ask ourselves, as we are laboring and living in this age, are we changed daily by the gospel? Or, or do we rely on some other kind of set of rules which tell us how to devote our 
our, un our, our resources and our efforts to get success? Or, or do the promises of God matter still? We see the church and church after church having trouble and failing, having difficulties and faltering, but that's human beings doing that. Why do we keep coming back then? Why do I keep coming back? There's only one reason, because of God. You know, all the misunderstandings and mountains out of molehill outrage of people cannot begin to obscure the glorious fact that God has made an everlasting covenant that he will cause salvation to go forth like a burning torch from his church. That's the future of the world. And it's not subject to change. Here, God is saying that someday, the people of this world will run to Christ through his church. No plan B. Maybe you're having trouble. You're bad-mouthing the church. Maybe you need to embrace Christ by re-embracing his church. If your relationship with your church is ambiguous or sporadic, subject to convenience, you can take it or leave it. The problem is not your relationship with your church. The problem is your relationship with Christ. Jesus has told us how he feels about the church. What do you say? You're going to agree with him? He delights in the church. Yes, delights in it. Even the way it is this now. He's committed to the revival of the whole world through the revival of the church. The most important created thing in all of the universe is the church. It's a crown of beauty in his hand. Your own greatest happiness ought to be the revival of your church. Is that in your prayers? Are you praying for the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit? Does the glory of Zion catch your attention? If it doesn't, may God grant mercy, for he will have to look elsewhere to find people who will share the burden of his heart. It's completely understandable and rational to talk like this because we see in the world so many things which don't jive for us. But the promises never change. It's difficult to consider learning to give ourselves over to something like no rest until Zion is perfect. That's an extremist position, and that's a challenge that each and, one of, each and every one of you children of God will work at until you die, because the work will never get done. And that's the point, though. You know, Jonathan Edwards, um, a, a pastor during a great revival, wrote a famous call out to the Christians of his day to unite in prayer for revival. It's very apparent, he says, from the word of God, that he often tries the faith and patience of his people. When they are crying to him for some great and important mercy, by withholding the mercy sought for a season. And not only so, but at first he may cause an increase of the dark appearances. And yet he, without fail, at last prospers those who continue urgently in prayer with all perseverance and who say, as Jacob, I will not let him go except he blesses. God, it seems, has been overcome by the prayer of people from time to time. Jacob wrestled with God and God said to him, you have striven with God and men and you have prevailed. 
Jesus compared prayer to a man pounding on his neighbor's door late at night until, because of his, I guess you just call it rudeness, but um, because of his persistence, the neighbor gets up and helps him. James says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. And God has put us all in this place and in such a time as this to pray down his power upon the ministry of the gospel in every dirty little nook and cranny of this globe and to not quit praying it down until the whole world is praising God. You know, it's good, thankful we should be, that despite all of the challenges and dis disappointments and setbacks and distractions I laid out, why we don't pray, why we don't call upon God, why we don't make this a priority, why we do. We should be thankful that despite all those things, it is in the word of God. God has sworn with his right hand and his strong arm to make Zion prosperous. What he's done is he's set out to prove and show through Christ just how much he can love and bless this wreck of humanity we all are. So we pick it up at verse 10. We see the desire of the Messiah for the glory of Zion, the glory of Zion shown to the nations, the watchman appointed for its glory, and finally, the great commission, which builds the glory of Zion. Go through, go through the gates. The um, repeating of a verb like that in Hebrew is kind of like a, okay, get really excited, go through, go through the gates. Clear the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Remove the stones, lift up a banner for the people, and proclaim salvation. In these last three verses of this chapter, we find the language of highway construction being used. The redeemed um, of the Lord are urgently commanded to go out, and the image is borrowed from the experience the exiles would have known. They have to go out from Babylon, be rescued from captivity. Equally so, those of us in our lives had to be rescued from the same Babylon, the spiritual Babylon. Uh, Revelation 18.4, um, the call to all of the elect to come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, to flee Babylon so that they may journey on this road that is prepared, this highway which leads to the new Jerusalem. But the highway that's being spoken of here, strange, it's the redeemed are on it, and, and they're just as urgently commanded to build that highway through I, the work of the church, through worship, discipleship, and evangelism. They're just as urgently commanded to build as to travel on it. And so, previous generations of faithful Christians leave behind a smooth highway for we who come behind them. Spiritual descendants to travel and raise the banner of the gospel by the proclamation of the Lord's salvation. The end result is that God's holy people, the Lord's redeemed. By the way, this, this passage refers to the people of God, the redeemed of God as Jesus, the Messiah's reward and recompense. This is an intersection with Isaiah 53 where um, the, the Lord is saying how he will honor his suffering servant by allotting to him the many. Here this is exactly what's being repeated. We who were sought and are found who were previously sought will be overflowing in Zion, a city that is no longer deserted, but cared for by Almighty God. It's hard to read the words there that are in verse 12. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. 
It's hard to see those words and, and not think of anything other than the word worldwide work of the church and the Great Commission, preaching the gospel of Christ, crucified and resurrected, making disciples of all nations who are being taught to obey everything the Lord has commanded. So this four-part description of Christ's passion for the glory of Zion comprises the desire he has himself, which passes to the nations and causes him to involve the very members of his bride in the intercession for her glory and the great commission carrying out the building of it. This unwavering and relentless passion for his people's perfection dominates this chapter and challenges every Christian to join him. Jesus will never stop speaking his words into the present. He will never stop speaking his words to present to himself even in splendor and without a spot or wrinkle or anything like that, his bride, holy and blameless. Now, the immediate application of all of this for us as members of the bride is to be holy ourselves. I mean, that is the arrangement that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is um, preparing his bride with. He will, she, that is the church, will be holy. Um, Peter, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Uh, on a whim, I prayed uh, as we were going through our intercessory prayer that we would be abnormal. Well, holiness is not normal in this world. If you want to follow Christ, you're going to have to get used to the abnormal. This text here in Peter and all of the other texts which exhort to holiness challenges us to love Jesus the bridegroom not halfway, not with, an, not with a divided love, but an undivided one, to cast all our idols down, invisible and visible, and all our worldly affections behind us. It challenges us to be just as zealous for holiness of other Christians as well and to be appalled when that is not the case. It calls on mature Christians to disciple younger Christians and bring holiness to completion in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. This chapter should put into our minds and hearts a zeal for the final perfection of the bride and a yearning in our hearts, an anticipation to see her finally glorious in heaven. That's the mind of Christ, see. The chapter also mentioned watchmen. This, this chapter also commands leaders in the church to be good watchmen. That is, to diligently carry out the role of protecting the church from heresy and division. The watchmen on the walls of Zion were to intercede and Yet those who have the, the offices in the church are to oversee not just that, but the doctrinal and practical uses of discipline in the church. Just as a watchman is awake all night because danger may come at any time, so elders, pastors too, must be careful to watch at all times to guard the flock from those who would tear it apart and sow division. Acts 20, 28 through 30. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Isaiah 62, 6 and 7 calls for the whole church to refocus their kingdom thoughts and prayers. And it calls for a relentless intercession for the church's purity and glory 
and holiness. This is hard work. And we will get weary if we undertake it, but it will be the kind of weary that the Lord will reward on the day he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Finally, and I do mean finally, as we have seen again and again in Isaiah, this chapter has a clear missionary thrust to it. We should be traveling on the highway to Zion, and as we do that, we should be inviting others to travel with us and making the highway as smooth as possible by the clear preaching of the gospel of Christ and the holy living that goes along with it in the pattern of Christ. What about, what about you? You're sitting here among a bunch of travelers to Zion. Are you on your way? Are you sought after? Have you been sought after? Have you been found by the Holy Spirit of God and called unto him? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, sinlessly gave his life on a cross of Roman shame for sinners. God saves sinners only in Jesus Christ, you know. And, and he only saves sinners. He doesn't save the, anyone else. What about you? Shall we pray? Lord, we pray for the glory of your holy people. We pray for we pray for their sanctification. We pray for the completion of your people, the perfection and bringing in of all the elect. We pray also, O oh Lord, that as we encounter the difficulties in living as a member of the bride in this world, that we count it all joy when we encounter various trials. May our only fear be you. And Lord, may our trust be in your promises, not in ourselves. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our number 345 is the hymn for concluding today. It's Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, number 345.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.